SpaceX just launched 170 times in a single year. That's twice every week, controlling 55% of all rockets leaving Earth. ULA's CEO of 12 years just resigned. Why did the company that once owned government launches lose its leader now? SpaceX reuses the same booster 25 times while ULA throws theirs away after one flight. Can you really compete when your rival launches twice a week and you're still building new rockets for every mission? Let's dive right in. ULA didn't collapse overnight. For years after SpaceX emerged, ULA executives dismissed the threat. They had Atlas V and Delta IV, rockets that never failed when it mattered. Launches cost over $150 million, sometimes pushing $200 million. But the Pentagon paid without question. Why? Because when you're launching a $2 billion spy satellite, reliability isn't negotiable. But that confidence created blindness. While ULA celebrated their perfect record, they missed the bigger shift happening underneath them. SpaceX wasn't just building cheaper rockets. They were rewriting the entire economics of spaceflight. When Falcon 9 started hitting $62 million per launch, ULA's initial response was predictable. Those missions aren't comparable to ours. Early on, they had a point. SpaceX was launching commercial satellites, not classified national security payloads. But here's what ULA didn't anticipate. SpaceX kept flying, mission after mission, success after success. The reliability gap that ULA relied on, it vanished. By the time the Air Force certified Falcon 9 for national security launches in 2015, ULA's monopoly was over. The contract awards started shifting. First a few missions, then more, then the majority. What's the real cost of being twice as expensive when your competitor proves they're just as reliable? You lose half your business. That's exactly what happened. Then came the geopolitical nightmare. Atlas V depended entirely on Russia's RD-180 engine. For years, this wasn't an issue. But after Russia's actions in Ukraine and rising tensions, Congress made it clear, U.S. national security launches cannot rely on Russian hardware. Period. ULA had no choice. Atlas V had to be retired whether they were ready or not. Delta IV was even worse. Costs were astronomical, and the rocket was already ancient by industry standards. ULA found themselves with two aging rockets, both headed for retirement and no replacement ready. Enter Vulcan. This wasn't just another rocket program. ULA bet the entire company on it. Development costs hit somewhere between $5 billion and $7 billion. Add another $1 billion for launch pads and ground infrastructure. For a company launching maybe five to 10 times per year, that's an almost impossible financial burden to recover from. But the real problem, Vulcan's engine. The BE-4 is built by Blue Origin, not ULA. That means ULA doesn't control their own supply chain. Every delay at Blue Origin automatically becomes ULA's delay. When Blue Origin struggled with engine development, and they did, Vulcan's timeline slipped again and again. In the modern launch market, delays are death. The government doesn't wait. Commercial customers don't wait. And SpaceX, they're always ready with another Falcon 9. Look at the recent national security space launch contracts. ULA secured 19 missions worth $5.3 billion. SpaceX, 28 missions worth $5.9 billion. ULA is still getting paid, still in the game. But the trend is unmistakable. They're losing ground in the one market they used to own completely. And contracts only matter if you can execute them. That's where the real crisis emerges. The numbers tell a story that's almost hard to believe. In 2023, SpaceX launched 98 times. The entire planet, every country, every company combined, launched 222 times. SpaceX alone was 44% of global orbital access. Think about that for a second. One private American company controlled nearly half of humanity's access to space. That's not just market dominance. That's restructuring an entire industry around a single player. Then 2024 arrived. SpaceX pushed to 134 launches. Global launches reached 259. SpaceX's share climbed to 52%, more than half. They weren't just leading the market. They were the market. Now we're in 2025 and the gap has become a chasm. 
SpaceX is on track for 170 launches this year out of 311 global missions. That's 55%. More than every second rocket leaving Earth belongs to SpaceX. They're launching twice every week, sometimes with only days between missions. ULA, they're struggling to launch twice every few months. Here's where the competitive gap becomes mathematically insurmountable. While ULA throws away millions of dollars of hardware after every single flight, SpaceX treats their boosters like airliners. Fly, land, refurbish, fly again. In early 2025, one Falcon 9 booster completed its 25th flight. The same physical rocket stage went to space and back 25 times. That's not a prototype. That's not a test. That's operational hardware doing what ULA said was impossible. What does this mean economically? SpaceX doesn't need to build a new first stage for every mission. That slashes production costs, reduces manufacturing pressure, and creates schedule flexibility that ULA simply cannot match. When weather delays a SpaceX launch, they usually have another booster ready. When ULA delays, everything cascades because they're building each rocket from scratch. But the real advantage isn't just the hardware, it's the data. Every launch is a learning opportunity. Weather integration, range coordination, payload processing, countdown procedures, real-world stress testing. When you launch 170 times in a year, you accumulate operational knowledge at a pace competitors can't touch. Problems get discovered faster. Solutions get tested faster. Processes get optimized in real time. This creates an experience feedback loop that compounds with every mission. ULA launches maybe 10 times a year. They're learning, but at 117 the pace. You can't close that gap with engineering talent alone. You need flight rate. SpaceX's landing capability extends beyond just bringing boosters back. They're autonomous drone ships. Just read the instructions. Of course, I still love you. And a shortfall of gravitas allow booster recovery even on high-energy missions. This means SpaceX can fly heavier payloads to more demanding orbits and still reuse the hardware. ULA has no equivalent. Every mission is expendable. Every launch burns through hardware that costs tens of millions to manufacture. The economic model doesn't work when your competitor can do the same mission for a fraction of the cost. Which brings us back to the CEO resignation. Tori Bruno led ULA for 12 years. He shepherded Vulcan through development, fought for contracts against SpaceX, and tried to position ULA for a competitive future. His departure isn't just personnel change, it's a signal. When a CEO leaves after more than a decade, especially during the most critical operational period in company history, it reveals internal pressure we don't see publicly. Either the board wanted different leadership, or Bruno saw the trajectory and decided the fight wasn't winnable with current resources. Either scenario is bad for ULA. They're entering the Vulcan operational era without the leader who built it. They're competing against SpaceX's exponential growth without stable executive leadership. And they're burning through their remaining government contracts with no clear path to cost competitiveness. ULA isn't collapsing tomorrow. They still have contracts. Vulcan is flying. The US government wants multiple launch providers for redundancy. But wanting competition and having viable competition are different things. So where does this leave ULA? They're a company built for a market that no longer exists. The slow, expensive, reliability-first approach worked when they were the only option. But SpaceX changed the game completely. They proved you can be reliable and fast and affordable. ULA's CEO resignation isn't just a leadership change. It's a marker of how far they've fallen behind. While Tori Bruno was fighting to keep ULA relevant, SpaceX launched the same booster 25 times, controlled 55% of Earth's orbital access, and made launching twice a week look routine. The math is brutal. ULA throws away hardware worth tens of millions after one flight. SpaceX reuses theirs 25 times. ULA launches maybe 10 missions a year. SpaceX hits 170. ULA depends on Blue Origin for engines. SpaceX controls their entire supply chain. Can ULA survive? Probably. The government wants backup options. But surviving isn't the same as competing. And right now, SpaceX isn't just winning the competition. They've redefined what winning looks like. What do you think? Can ULA find a way back? Or is the gap already too wide to close? 
drop your thoughts in the comments below. If this breakdown gave you a clearer picture of what's really happening in the launch industry, hit that like button and share this with anyone who still thinks traditional aerospace can catch up. And subscribe to Space Update 24 Hours. We're tracking every move in this space race. See you in the next one. December 18, Roscosmos dropped a bombshell that contradicts everything they said before. Instead of building a brand new space station from scratch, Russia will now reuse old ISS modules for their future orbital station. These same modules are contaminated with dangerous bacteria and fungi. 65% of samples exceed safety limits. Their own scientists warned against this in 2022, calling the ISS a bacteriological international. So what changed? The answer involves SpaceX's unstoppable rise and one devastating war. Let's dive right in. To understand just how dramatic this reversal is, you need to know what Russia originally planned. The Russian orbital station, ROS, was supposed to be their comeback moment. A cutting-edge facility in polar orbit, flying over all of Russia's territory, conducting Arctic research, and studying cosmic radiation near the poles where Earth's magnetic field offers almost no protection. This wasn't just about keeping up with China or the U.S. This was about reclaiming the prestige they lost when the Soviet Union collapsed. The design specs were genuinely impressive. ROS would operate largely unmanned, controlled remotely from Earth, with periodic crew visits instead of permanent occupation. Robotic arms would handle assembly and maintenance outside the station, drastically reducing dangerous spacewalks. They even planned to deploy and manage satellites directly from orbit, something no space station has ever accomplished. Vladimir Kozhevnikov, the station's chief designer, announced in July 2024 that artificial intelligence would support operations without replacing human decision-making. Russia was positioning itself to leapfrog the ISS entirely, but here's where SpaceX enters the picture. While Russia was drafting these ambitious plans on paper, SpaceX was actually executing theirs in reality. Starship is rapidly becoming operational, making the cost of building new orbital 